Okay. Go ahead and get on that little comment that folks want to share for today's meeting. Do you have someone uh, just logging oh, in here? Okay. <laughs> oh, Jack Locker. All right. Good morning. <laughs> Jack, can you hear me? Cool. He's one of my students. Oh, this guy, well, he's graduating this weekend. Can you introduce yourself? As soon as your mouth's empty. You're muted though, Jack. You're muted, Jack. Hopefully. I was, uh, yeah, so I was, my name's Jack Locker. Um, live on Village Grove, at least my parents do, moving back there after graduation, um, which is this Sunday. I'm an environmental studies student with a place based education certificate. Um, and I did a lot of really cool, fun stuff with Gary um, during my time wow, at UVL. Really? Cool and fun stuff with Gary? <laughs> Congratulations, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we are just in the public comment uh, portion of the agenda. If you have anything else you'd like to share. I'm all set. No pressure. <laughs> 7 a.m. Okay. For, for a senior who graduated on Sunday. <laughs> I think we'll cut him a break. All right. All right. Marriage yeah. for studying all week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Studying, right here. On to the minutes of uh, May 1st. <clears throat> In four one third line down, it says web design. What just only because that threw me for a loop. Yeah, just, web. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what's a web design? Yeah. <laughs> Very thorough notes this yeah. week. Easy. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, next week's might not be as, as thorough, <laughs> frankly. I think I spent a little bit too much time. <laughs> 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 that would be a good idea. <laughs> Definitely kind of paraphrase a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. Highlights. Yeah. Highlights. We used to take our own notes. I don't know, were you here when we were doing that? No. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, you're there the night before the meeting. So, what we say here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My excuse is that our, our DRB minutes are usually quite detailed and they should be. It's hard to get in and out of right. the detailed. Right. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it's that sort of public record that right. it matters. Yeah. I make a motion to accept unless is there any additional changes? I am all set. Okay. I'll second. Sorry, I'm up next. Uh, any uh, <laughs> any uh, discussion on the motion? <clears throat> all right. Any, uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All yeah, right, just logged in. I think we can. Did you like the minutes, Ken? Good morning. <laughs> I'm still eating breakfast, and my camera's off. 
It's okay. Um, we just uh, approved the minutes. Hopefully you didn't have any uh, major concerns with the minutes. I do not. Okay. Um, all right, so that brings us to the ERF uh, Wild About Williston presentation. So from last time, last, hour, last meeting, we were going to take a look at this um, to share. Was this is to share with um, Shelburne or the the South the other group whose name I can never remember? South yes. or something. Champlain Valley Concert Album Player. Yeah. <laughs> there are there are lots of acronyms, and then I have a hard time keeping track. Of it, so uh, yeah, I think that can be part of the discussion. Um, I linked the slides from the Wild About Williston presentation. Eric, at the last meeting, I thought you had mentioned one other material, and I, I didn't know what you were yeah, referring to. Yeah, I saw your email and thought about it, and then um, forgot to think about it more. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, I believe, uh, I know what I was thinking. So there was, um, at one point, Melinda had put together a I think it was a, a couple, at least a few slides to come out a full presentation might be a lot, but it was a few slides um, just describing the ERF itself. Okay. Um, and the... Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm remembering what you're talking uh, about. The priority, the priority map. And I think this... Okay. Um, oh, yeah. This, uh, what you what you links to here is a... Um, Presentation that it's it it's I think it's probably good for um, Shelburne, but uh, this one and this one's more designed to be more public facing, and uh, Melinda's was more just for like internal conservation commission refreshers kind okay. of thing. Yeah. yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to check with Melinda on that presentation. Um, see where it's where it's hidden in our files. Yeah, I know it's out there somewhere. Hidden in yes. emails. Yeah. Um, and also, I didn't see the slide that I presented in there. I can email yeah. it to you. I have it on the Prezi. So I did some, um, since the last meeting, I pulled up the presentation that I gave in which we had one, this slide. Um, and that was when I kicked it over to Andrew and we switched over to the PowerPoint slides. Um, and I looked at what was out there. There's There are probably some things that are um, useful to put into just a PowerPoint or PDF format. Um, they can be done pretty easily. So I started to fix up a couple of the Prezi spotlights that could then be just taken into a PowerPoint slide. Um, but I don't have any of the talking points for your slide and it's okay. just a picture. So it is, I think people can look at the uh, timeline, natural history timeline and kind of like, oh, okay, I get what this is about, but it might be a nice. little blur. Yeah, but yeah. it might be nice to accompany it with just a couple yeah. bullet points or something to uh, a key points in okay, I'll the do timeline. That. So, Reed, you also have like an intro slide. Obviously, this is just a, I figured you. Yes. Yeah. So I have I have an intro <clears throat> slide that just says like why were we doing yeah. about Williston, and then yeah, that's um, great. And then there's and it has the uh, some fact. Um, no, in fact, it has some stats uh, on it that was part of just a group activity to see if audience could guess what the stats were in terms of like how many miles of primitive trails and how many acres of different types of conserved land. Um, and then there were a lot of aerial uh, photos, um, which I don't know that those necessarily need to be uh, included in the deck. Um, I think the important part with there, there were two. One that talked about um, zoning, and I had a map of uh, our zoning just to show mm -hmm. like how we managed to sort of contain the development a bit. And then two more maps on the prioritization and SWHA to show how those things lined up a bit with the zoning too, uh, in terms of the areas of town that were most valuable to preserve for habitat or natural resources. It might be nice to have the one PowerPoint, maybe we don't use it yes. for much that has everything in it, just yep. so in the future we can snag from it and mm -hmm. easily. And that was uh, the level of effort I thought I could finish 
how it was ex exporting some of these, add them, yeah, give them to Andrew to add to the PowerPoint deck, and, <clears throat> along with mm -hmm. Laura's talking points. And I have all the talking points for um, what Eric and I were introducing at the event. So I was trying to figure out if there's any way to put that in. I think this is too much. I think this is the kind of thing that we need like a student project said, here's a ton of notes that goes with this presentation. If you can find a way to um, not make a bunch of wordy slides. Well, even if you scan them in and just put them at the end, just just so we have them, because I'm yeah. sure in a year we'll say, hey, what did we say to them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, that was in a Google Doc, right? Yes, yeah, so it's just a Google Doc, Google Text Doc. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That would be a good. Something to share publicly or not. not. Yeah, no, I was thinking I needed to synthesize a bit more because it was kind of more verbatim what we were going to say. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's probably too much detail for carrying forward. I think we can maybe take like the best 50% of it and somehow uh, um, put it into bullet point format or something. Cool. People can see. I'm happy to. Work with it, really get those last few slides added to the deck. Okay. I do think it adds more to it because it's a lot of the context. Um, your deck covered uh, examples of conservation and how they uh, developed the, the concepts developed and then the, how the conservation was funded and stuff. Um, but the rest of what's in the present covers. Um, um, why we did an event called Wild About West and the natural history piece, and then the other pieces of work um, like prioritization and SWHA that have, uh, uh, and the 30 by 30 um, conversations we've been having about 30 by 30, even though we're doing more like 30 by 50 sort of in our planning, but uh, the fact that we're doing planning around. Um, so, okay, that sounds good. Um, I just with the oh, it's not part of this anymore. The um, PowerPoint uh, that Andrew had linked up to, I think, um, and you might again if you could find that presentation that Melinda had. And I think Simon probably had too, but I just don't remember. I I know that we looked at it with Melinda. Um, uh, you could probably find. Or you have a, I think it would be nice to include, let's try that, a map uh, or the map with the parcels in town that are conserved and, and or at least a, or a list of the number of parcels just for context. Okay. Um, in the background, there is that map. Yeah. Of, that's, but it's hard to read the right. like hash mark <clears throat> at the top yeah. of the actual yeah. Yeah. satellite. Yeah. I guess I was thinking of the one that's. I think I thought we had one that's just a little bit simpler to interpret. Mm -hmm. It's just like parcels that are already conserved and maybe parcels that are a high priority or something for future conservation. Something like that. I don't know. It's something that just illustrates parcels that are conserved in town, I think, just for them to see where we're at with that, mm -hmm. that work here in town might be useful. And then but also the 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 next steps, which are the parcels that we have prioritized for conservation. Um, How about, oh, oh wait go ahead i just i wanted to go back to the um the discussion about talking with shelver and then talking with champlain valley conservation partnership it seems like there's a you know we i think we had a good discussion with shelver and might want to try to continue having those conversations <laughs> and talk to someone from Hinesburg or another neighboring town in that partnership. And, you know, there's, we've had at our, our last meeting that discussion about future outreach for ERF to landowners in Williston. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like having more conversations with neighboring towns might be something you're interested in and that this will help with that. We can have, kind of have an exchange that's, that's more um, defined, we kind of have our ducks in a row and say, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Which I think block. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree. I think that would be a very useful conversation to have, um, particularly with the towns that we share a border with, um, which would be what, Shelburne, St. George, Hinesburg, South Burlington, and Essex. Yes. And really, yeah, I think the Valley. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. <clears throat> 
just yeah to, to show them what the same map here's what we're looking at and here's the parcels that are that are prioritized for conservation particularly those along the county borders what do you do you have anything that you've been doing else similar that we could chat about they prioritize ways talk about ways to share uh, or, or uh, conserve lands that are along the shared border that kind of a conversation makes sense yeah are there are there any properties <laughs> that straddle two communities that would also be potentially interested in, in conservation um that could anticipating future um challenges with uh conserving land on both sides of the border um could, could be I mean, a, certainly some with Sutherland and, and Richmond too I think yeah uh, yeah. Where yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah I can see the hash marks that are just on the other side yes. like there's yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's okay no, yeah. no problem but I think that's a great idea to go. partner up and mm -hmm. uh, get a lot more out of it as a whole <laughs> there are a few that I, are I love the idea of cross border collaboration. I think mm -hmm. like the, we do have a, like the Lake Iroquois Recreation District is something that we partner with on you know multiple towns, and I feel like it could be a model. Although I'm not sure that we need an association, like a separate association for every parcel but yeah it makes a lot of sense to think on the landscape scale rather than like within the bounds of municipal sort of town lines the other thing I was gonna say is that um going back to like the difference between like the ag conservation as you all probably remember from that sur that early draft survey that I shared a master's student is working on um, a database of all town owned forests in the state and how they're used and how they're managed, et cetera. And there is an existing list from 2015 that we were hoping to use as like the foundation for the new list and update. And we just spot checked Williston yesterday to see like what was in the old list and they're essentially like there's like a gravel pit <laughs> in the old list there's something that like i've never heard as a conservation area that's like a, a it's called like the blueberry swamp or something and it's on it's it's like oh, marshall ab. yeah marshall yeah it's ab. marshall ab yeah <laughs> and so like this this just brings up for me like do we have a comprehensive, like, is that on there? Blueberry Swamp? <laughs> it, yeah. It's, uh, Wetlands. It's, oh, it yeah, is, it is. It is on there. It's, yeah, it's it's hard to call it conserved given what's around it, but yeah. I mean, it was it was designed to be, but then they went and put Marshall Avenue right through the middle of it without consulting wow. us, I don't think. Wow. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it's, it's just like a comment of like, <laughs> For both like Julie's, the master's student's sake and our sake into the future and probably the 30 by 30 initiative, I think it would be cool for us to think at some point like a little more deeply, sorry, I'm still chewing, about like the different types of conservation areas that we have, right? Like that idea that like conserved ag land is not functioning the same as a conserved wooded area doesn't mean it's like better or worse, but it's functioning differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I like I like the comments about cross border. It's something we haven't really tried to do before that I'm aware of, and I think it, it seems like a logical next step given that we feel like we're getting closer and closer to having a pretty holistic view of conservation within our borders. It seems like the next step is to figure out. Well, it makes me think: Did we undervalue potential conservation of? border towns because we didn't take into account uh conservation on the other side of the border i don't know when we did our prioritization whether we considered 
whether we even have the data for uh, things on the other side of the border. So they might be, I'd be interested, for instance, to go back and look at uh, our prioritization results and see for those border parcels, uh, did they rank lower on average than interior ones just because we didn't have data for what was bordering it uh, to help support its value. So that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, and the other is that um, it reminds me that when, when the form-based code and growth center work was being done, one of the things that came up was uh, how can we make uh, pockets where wildlife has like at least stopover locations if it's trying to traverse the growth center um, and the different services can be provided, uh, for instance, like for birds, insects, et cetera, being able to have like a wetland mm -hmm. uh, within the growth center. It's not probably where something lives full time, but it might be uh, still valuable. And we'd have to know what else, what what services we have throughout town and what might be lacking. Um, yes, I think so. I think that would be a good um, conversation to have with the other group, the other communities. I know that we, when we put that priority list together, we looked just internally and we didn't look at what was on the other side of the border. Um, I feel like I'd like to think at least that we talked about that, and I but I can't remember why we just looked inward to Williston and not externally. My brain says that Linda said we don't have good data on what's on the other side, so we can't rely on it. But... I do have a memory though of thinking about like contiguous forest block. Like I remember us having a conversation about like the Catamount, Talcott, Pine Ridge, right? Like the idea of like corridors. I don't know if it like made it into the consideration, but I remember we at least like talked about it. Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was yes within the board, within Wilson's borders, but if there was a parcel that <clears throat> didn't border other forest blocks within Williston, but did border forest blocks outside of Williston, I don't think, we're thinking we might not have captured that in the privatization numbers. But I think this this possible group that we're trying to form should help with that a lot. I mean, yeah. if we just know each other, what we're doing, and you just make relationships mm -hmm. so that, you know, Andrew hears from somebody, hey, they're thinking of conserving this. Do we have anything to, can we help in some way or conserve something on the other side of the border? Right, like the, um, well, you know, it's uh, it's morning. The, the Winooski Valley mm -hmm. uh, Road, where the um that little farm stand with with the flowers, what's it called? Um oh my God. talking about the red, Wilson, the red barn place? No, down here. Um pocket full of posies. Yeah. Oh okay. yeah. That place. Um, I mean, their farm is directly on the Richmond line. And when I'm looking at the ERF priority map, they're not a high priority, they're a medium priority. And that's interesting to me because if we're thinking about the ERF as potential use of both natural and working landscape prioritization, you've got a major element of town, basically right on right with Richmond. Um, that to me, like that would be a you know if that ever got posed for development, that would be a huge deal. Um, for a lot of reasons, I, I, you know, so that, that's, that's where it comes to me, you know, forefront in terms of like that, that would be a area right for, um, right for collaboration. I also know that there's a lot of mountain biking trails right on the other side of the Williston line right there. And that that was a big part of the town mapping process where, um, linking up that, um, uh, Catamount Forest trails with the uh, Richmond trails or just protecting, you know, that landscape in between was sort of a big deal. Are you talking about the floodplain all the way to the easternmost? Yeah, you that got area? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Uh, pocket, pocket full of posies, or I think that's the name. They're on, they're on our side. And then you've got that, you've got that big um, grass and cow operation on the right side. 
Yeah, yeah so where you are, Andrew, is kind of far, and then the pocket full of posies, I think it's like that yellow triangle on the other side of the too. Yeah, that's the private property for sure, but then their farm is that. Is that it's, stretch? Is it this feature here? Yeah. No, it's the other side of it too. It's that one. Yeah, it's that one. It's right, it's right on the Richmond line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that Conan's is, right? Conan's is in that's, that's Conan's. Yeah. It's but it's the other side, isn't it? The like yeah. immediately adjacent to Conan? Mm -hmm. On the other side of the road. The pocket full of posies. Is it that one right there? That's yeah, that's where they're farm. That's where that's they're where the, well, the yeah. store the, the store. Isn't the store on the no. south side of Route 2? Yeah, yeah, this is Route where the greenhouses are. Oh, I'm looking at 89. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's what I thought. I'm All right, sure sorry. That piece yeah, I can't see Route 2. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Anyways, I just think I that's an angles at this point. <laughs> that's an example of where the collaboration having having these things sort of mapped out or prioritized. And then that stood out to me as being, oh, why mm -hmm. is that? Why is that not a darker shade of green? Because that that should be a priority potentially. Something. Yeah, you weren't right. here, David, when we um, and Terry either when we um, did the prioritization. So another thing we could consider is it's you know, nice update the prioritization. Yeah. Update the prioritization. Basically, the factors that like the formula how strongly each factor was weighted depended on the collective knowledge of the group. And so the group's composition has changed. We could just redo our our uh, relative weighting uh, as a group again. I think we did like this. Uh, we did a survey where we all answered a bunch of questions and said, if you had a parcel that had this mm -hmm. versus a parcel that had this, mm -hmm. which one would you mm -hmm. conserve first? Yeah. Was it all that it little quantitative? That's why I remember yeah. as much as you can. For and time. each individual yeah. question doesn't mean that we would always conserve, let's say, like a wetland versus a forest mm -hmm. block. But what it did is across the group, everybody's scores were could then combined and it created weightings. And then the the formula for each parcel said, okay, it gets you know this much weightings if it has a forest block on it. It gets this much weighting if it's next to another parcel that has uh, a forest block. That kind of thing. How do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, remember, I, re I remember it, but I think that I like remember. our, I feel like we had like a long discussion about yeah, what, we if we were okay with that. And like, <laughs> like ultimately we felt like the values of the group were like just defeat, like dispersed. What am I trying to say? Diverse. That's the word. <laughs> Any more coffee. Diverse enough that mm -hmm. like my desire to always conserve forest would be like, balanced mm -hmm. by eric's desire to always conserve water right yeah. um yeah. but i mean like i think there are like we could think about it a different way and i would also say that i think that like external stressors have evolved since 2020 so like i'm thinking about watershed forestry a lot these days and doing projects about that whereas like i really wasn't in 2020 and i also think like development threat is super different now so like david's concern about that area being developed um down on route two like like i think that we even though there was development pressure in 2020 it was not nearly what like it has escalated so much in in the last you know handful of years and so i don't think that it would be bad to revisit like what are the current threats and also like think more holistically about like what are the threats going to be long term like what's not going to be a trend maybe and like what is the diverse what is the function like I think that like we talked about what different types of conservation were in town last time but I don't remember talking about like function of those different conservation lands in in like a really in-depth way maybe I'm just forgetting but I think we could like revisit the way we prioritize if we wanted to. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I don't recall talking about function either. Of course, I couldn't recall any of what Bridget was just saying. I don't need to mind, but I'm not the best, best uh, gauge. We do, you get money. But uh, so, <laughs> but you just have to ask, what were your kids doing? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Just having that How were your kids doing? Well, I, I, think, think, all the, yeah. I think the key was that we, we knew we needed to prioritize some way. And there was no one silver bullet like, oh, there's this formula out there that we could use. We had to come up with our own thing. And to Kim's point, we just looked at the group and said, all right, we've got like people who have expertise in different areas. Perfect. Let's just 
put all of our expertise together mm -hmm. and come up with our own formula. But that formula does not have to stick forever. We get to change this whenever it makes sense for our conservation goals. Mm -hmm. so. And also, I think it's really important that every time we do this, we say like any prioritization and ranking is ultimately a reflection of the values of the group, right? Like not just there's not one silver bullet way to do it, but any way you do it is a reflection of the values of the group, right? Like if we are like, well, we're going to choose carbon, then mm -hmm. like that's like us prioritizing carbon over, I don't know, whatever other, you know what I mean? Livelihoods or something. Yeah. So I think I just want to like, be always be the forest social scientist in the room that's like management is a reflection of values <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah agreed um okay so we have uh another agenda item we need to move on to the hda contracting process but i feel like um i don't know that we've given andrew a lot of clear direction on <laughs> yeah. these yet. so um well i'm gonna make sure andrew has the rest of the material yeah and i'll thank give you that blurb that sounds good. That's points. easy. Okay, so great. So uh, those two things, and then if um, maybe Belinda can find that PowerPoint for you, um, then if you want to try and merge all that into one, then we can take a look at that next time. Yeah, that sounds good. Great. I think that is the short term <laughs> and the the discussion about outreach to other communities, be talking to people about strategies, what their plans are. Yeah, let's I talk about valuable. that a little more. And, and then I think the long term I see here is is town plan um, with having a stated goal about continuing to reassess our ERF prioritization. Mm -hmm. We're talking about what, what Kim is saying about um, you know these thirty by thirty goals and, and what type of management we're we're doing and and what we're conserving land for. Um, yeah. Um, is it is it would it be possible to develop a um, database is too strong of a word but a sort of record? I was thinking more of like a resource for all of those neighboring communities and whether or not they have a similar prioritization type map um, available, just as a point of reference, so that when we do have discussions about you know today it was Route Two but tomorrow it's going to be you know. North Williston or whatever, mm -hmm. that it might be something that we could just call up and use as a, as a reference. That it, That's probably so part of that longer say, Hey, what's, what's Richmond doing in this right. area? Or what are they thinking about yeah. doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I think it's a great, great question to be asking. And if we can show our ERF map to other people and yeah. show, you know, this is what we've been doing, I think that might be valuable. And I really have no concept of of if people, other people, other towns have right. this. So great. I think those are good steps forward. I, I might offer a third, um, which I guess I would consider a um, medium term goal, um, which would be to um, create a short, concise, but um, descriptive history of where of of the work that we've done in this area in town and this um so like reads read on the spot a uh, recollection of how we did all that math for example um you know so you know when the day comes that reads throws in the towel on the conservation commission <laughs> can't be here to pull that up on the spot uh we have we can go back and say all right here's what here's here's how we got from what if we had pre ERIF prioritization map to where we are today? And maybe not, you know, meeting by meeting, but or even year by year, but like phase by phase. Like, so here's here's how we developed the map. Here's um, you know, how we got to the wild about Williston, and then um steps beyond that, whatever direction we might go, just as a you know, just a record. So the you know, future we and future conservation members can pull that up and 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 see how we remember how we got to where we are at that point in time. So I just want to throw one more thing out while I'm back. Mm -hmm. I think the, the value to me to these groups like is is along the borders and I think a big one is along the river. Yeah. Yeah. I mean because we we've known for a long time that we can use ERF money to buy buffer zones next to the river, but we've never used it really. Mm -hmm. So I think that partnership <clears throat> on both sides could be really effective at making a difference too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I got just in Swinooski's. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just saying, I'd love to learn why we didn't make the comet farm like for dark green and why is only light green. Well, they are underwater sometimes. Yeah. But but yeah. you guys all know what it's like when you drive along the road, you look over yeah. and the, the fields are like up against the right road. against there and, and even yeah. eroding yeah. as you watch. Well, you know? yeah. to the point, oh. to that point, I don't think oh. a, the ERF could ever be used to like buy out the whole farm, but you're totally right, Gary. Is yeah. You could buy 50 feet on each right. side. And, and then feet. develop it as like a forest sure. pathway yeah. even. Um, if, yeah. You know, that's a little ambitious, but. Well, we've had that in there. We know yeah, we can exactly. use the Arab money for it, but we haven't been active at all. But I think if yeah. we form a partnership and we can say, hey, let's both be active, that that could be enough to make a difference. Yeah. All right. My memory, my memory is the, I'll, this is my last thing. I promise I'll be fast. My memory is that one of the reasons that we didn't prioritize those low-lying river riparian areas was that like they are undevelopable by definition and so that they like had their own level of protection baked into them but I think I think to our point about like maybe needing to revisit the prioritization we were not a map we weren't thinking about like how intense flooding was going to get how intense it has gotten in the last few years and that there is like that threat to the road or like I was out biking yesterday when that thunderstorm happened and I like booked it up French Hill to get home and it I was like oh I'm like not actually safe in the shoulder right now because it's like full of water mm -hmm. so like and like those things were not in our mind right we were really thinking about like development threat in my memory as like maybe the and like climate change. And I think that there are outside pressures that have intensified since 2020 that like we would do this differently now. Uh, before you switch away, I wanted to just show people where you can go. Something everybody's really interested in the, the methodology. So if you go to the town website and <clears throat> you're good, yeah, Mike, you can put it back on the screen. <clears throat> Because we knew there was that this same question was going to come up over and over again. So Melinda made sure to put something out there. So if you go to the um, town website and go to natural resources and then protected open space. And then go to um, conservation prioritization. The first one at the bottom is the methodology document. If you open the middle one there. Uh, this is exactly, I think, what everybody's mm. curious about. So this talks about all the different factors that were considered description of why they were included. And then if you scroll down, you'll actually see the map. It shows um, the out the outcome of our, um, yeah, there you go. So there's the weightings that, so if you're wondering like, why did things get darker or lighter? Um, these were the relative weightings of the importance across our group at that time of the different factors we considered, but there may be factors not on this list, uh, criteria, and there may be different weightings that we want to go with moving forward. Okay. Yes. I do remember that now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, can we keep some time on next time, next uh, month's, I, I guess, agenda at this point to yes. keep this conversation going? Great. All right. Um, next up, <clears throat> so we've got about 15 minutes uh, for the have it to talk about the uh, habitat disturbance assessment contracting process. So this is just a um, uh, an opportunity to revisit this approach that we've taken to have uh, the town solicit contractors to do the habitat disturbance assessments rather than the applicants um, hiring a contractor themselves. Uh, so we've had what, one one person, one project to go through this, maybe two. We have a couple ongoing, I believe, about two or three. We had that uh, most recent KEV pre-application was withdrawn. But which one was it? Uh, that was the Mountain View Road parcel that was about three acres. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Just from Warner or yeah. across from Adam Smart. Yeah, so that was withdrawn. <clears throat> or at least, yeah. The first sale sign is still there. I think there's two up now. I believe they're closing on, on a sale is why they're... Uh, so they all sold the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so I, I prepared some notes and it will look like a lot of text and try not to overwhelm you guys in our 15 minutes we have, but and I'm, and I'm sorry that I didn't share this earlier. I did link it on Monday afternoon, but following the discussion with Malcolm Willard, the Knob Hill mm -hmm. HDA. Mm -hmm. Eric had asked about following up and, and this is this is that. So I, I wanted to just share point out some specific parts of the bylaw that um, you know this is the language that was changed to make the HDA um, a town process. And I've underlined some some key parts of that. So um, that the town is contracting it, the applicant pays a fee, and it mentions that uh, it points the someone towards the fee schedule. Um, that's one of the discussion points I'd, I'd like to talk about further. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then there's a, a bit of a disclaimer about when that HDA has to be completed and hey, this might take some time and be aware. So um, that's that's some of the bylaw. It's not all of it. There is a more detail there about what should be included. And um, I'm not sure how much you all have looked at that. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is just a general overview of the, the reminder of what part of the process we're talking about here. And so this here is, is kind of our, our general um, process for discretionary permits. And I've underlined pre-app and discretionary permit because those two are the, the times when you all are, are reviewing HDAs, and you can see there's there's some more steps beyond that. Um, and then I've gone through down through this bullet list of of you know how it goes from a recommendation from the conservation commission at pre-app that the DRB then also can um, adopt as a recommendation to the applicant. How that translates into the discretionary permit. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, how after that pre application, the applicant contacts staff to contract an HDA. Um, some kind of important notes as I see them on, on that process, and I'll go into more detail in a second. Um, and then once the HDA is completed, the applicant submits that discretionary permit. The WCC then reviews it again. Um, once again, drafts recommendations that can then be adopted as conditions, which are requirements for final plans. So the discussion points that I drafted um, are about the staff contact to the applicant after pre-application, um, how we go about choosing who those contractors are. And so that's my request for qualifications. Um, that should say contracting, not contacting. Um, a specific firm, um, fixed rate pricing, and the the process for for feedback. And so, I'll start with the number one. Um, I'd like to formalize our process. We after a pre application, we send what's called a notice of decision letter that tells applicant that they have a year to submit a discretionary permit. And I'd like to formalize a a section of that that says, you know, you've been required to do an HDA, um, I recommended. Please contact staff and, and yeah. with a similar disclaimer that, that I mentioned before that says, you know, this may take some time, additional money too, that you're paying down. Um, so I, I wanted to run that past to you, see if you have any comments. Um, so yeah, I guess if anyone has questions, comments about that, I think it seems reasonable, but. Yeah, I think um, being as transparent about all that as we can is definitely a good thing. Um, and giving them a the applicant a some um, sense of what the time frame is to complete at least this specific step in really would be good as well. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, it would be helpful to. And maybe that's what you have down below. The number two request for qualifications. 
versus the contract in a specific frame. So is that where you you were thinking we would the town would um, just put out a, a request for bids for specific projects versus requests for to just line people up as yeah as we go to yeah I was envisioning when we set this that we would literally have a page of here's five people mm -hmm. that are that we feel are qualified and you know and not have to go out for bid each time on it just say you know pick one two of these I guess the town requires two mm -hmm. and and get a quote from them and go from there I mean I don't see why we should have to do a request for qualification each time, do it once, and then maybe edit it once a year as things change. But so if I may, the, I, I agree. And, okay. and I, the current process is we are, I've contacted firms, and you're correct, I'm required to contact at least two firms for <clears throat> quotes for our purchasing policy. However, that list that I've been contacting firms from is, is not official, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> there's a bit of, uh, there aren't many, it's a pretty small place. <laughs> there aren't many firms that are doing this, but I, I do think that the staff opinion is, is that having a official list that is, you know, we do a one request for qualifications that we have a, a solidified list would be better. Yeah. Like um, an annual I think, certification or something like once a year, we just verify that yeah. these are all still working yeah. terms that we would it, well the frequency is probably there's probably a um standard frequency based on you know if you yeah. review a qualification, <laughs> you know, it's you're usually good for like at least three years. Three years yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in the eyes of the applicant that makes it more legitimate. And then we don't have a question of I don't like how much this costs. Can I find someone else? Sure. And, and it's no, we have our list. Yeah. And yeah. This is you, you know, get some things, but it's all that was the that was kind of the point of the whole thing. I, I think is we we needed to know that the people they were choosing were unbiased and mm -hmm. and you know professional. Yeah. yeah. And qualified. I, and I, I think that there's a you know a reasonable amount that staff can do that, but I I think for the applicants safe to say that we've done this process right. and we're protecting Here's your option here. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know about the fixed pricing. <clears throat> Would that be like per acre or per because it's going to vary with a 15 acre lot versus a 200 right. acre farm or something. And so that's part of it too. And it's that's another thing I want to discuss is the fixed rate pricing that we've seen has been anywhere from a little under 2000 for that Knob Hill project to wow. the the um, that's not CSWD project was 5,700, mm -hmm. 5,700. So hmm. and we've seen some, some they were, I can't remember, are they roughly the same size projects? No, CS, CSWD was 55, 35 acres. I think it was 35 acres. Uh, Knob Hill was less than 10. Yeah. Because they, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't have that open space requirement. So per acre, those are relatively similar rates. Yes. Um, some feedback I've gotten from um, I talked to a representative from Arrowwood. He, I forget his name. Michael. I think it was Michael. Said that the fixed rate pricing is, is actually pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. He was interested in what the other quotes we were getting were mm -hmm. uh, because we haven't contracted with them yet. And just from a, you know, from their perspective, having to provide a fixed rate is is challenging. I think they have to. But maybe they, they have to go high there, like categories zero to ten, or you know, under ten acres, under between ten and thirty, or you know, mm -hmm. something like that that they could. And and I think this this way of doing it should create some competition too. You know, so it should be in the best interests of. The landowner who's paying for it too. There's going to be some competition if we request two quotes, and yeah, I would think. And well, if you just have a qualification page and you say, you know, and so you follow up with an applicant and you say, you know, the conservation commission has asked you to do a, you know, HDA. Here's the page with all of the vendors. It's on you to sort of call them and get pricing on your own. Then we, then the town is not in on any of the pricing issues and all 
we have is that, you know, if there's three or if there's eight qualified firms, all we're looking for is that you use one of those qualified firms. We don't care how much you paid for it or how many times you called to get a better price. Right. And it would save you a lot of work. Right. So yes. go ahead. Yeah. So, but the, the whole purpose of this was that we, we'd never had an HDA come back and say that we should, that the applicant should change, change anything yeah. about their application. And so this was an experiment to see whether we, uh, received different results when we were the the yeah. the employee we were employing the uh -huh. uh, the the contractor to right. do the work, mm -hmm. um, and we can ask for things because we're the one contracting them. We can ask for things like we would like you to come to the meeting to present your report, things like that. That maybe are so that that's that's a contract then with the town, correct? To yeah, yeah, do that scope yeah. of work yeah okay so the the applicant pays the fee to the town sure and the town well solicits the contractor and hires the contractor then we are going to have to get thick skin because you're going to get comments like yeah. what we got from the knob hill yep yep, yep. yep. i actually and, sorry, to david's point like i think that's the right approach like the reason that we did this was to ensure validity of the report not to save the applicant money and I understand the frustration as an applicant of not being able to like control who does this because of the financial costs but I think that what we've heard from people is a lot of questions about like why they can't pick their person and so maybe it's not a matter so much of like I don't think these these ideas of like <clears throat> multiple quotes is a bad idea but maybe the the solution or like a better strategy is to be like really clear about why we do it this way like basically can we summarize what reed just said so that like it's in it and put it somewhere so that when like you're an applicant it's really explicit like why you don't get to do it why you don't get to contract it so you don't then come to conservation commission and say like why are you controlling this process because we're super transparent about it Yeah, I agree. And that's that, exactly, I guess, what I was, I was um, thinking too, Kim. And the more information we can share up front, um, the, the the better um, regarding how how we select a con how the process, what the process is, how we select a contractor. And um, if we can, some estimate of what the price is, probably per acre is I think the best metric I can think of. <laughs> That's but also thing. like why we like why right like those things that you just said but like also like we we control it for this reason here's how we do it and here's why we control it yeah so do we have any anything written down what the expectations are of the of the hwa like here's things that are important to to our town you know wildlife corridors weather you know all these things that that might help too, because here's what we expect from the from the firm that's doing the work. That's that's in the bylaw. Uh, okay, good. I, but that might help to have that in a paragraph or two in the introduction information for the applicant. Yeah, and for for the firm, mm -hmm. you know, here's what we want. Here's what you need to do. Kind of like how many of these do we do? So curious. Sorry. It's like uh, a couple of years. Yeah, it depends on the year. Yeah. yeah. But this year we've done fair few. Probably mm -hmm. sweet four to ten a year. I, I don't know. So see, yeah, I think there's been five or six. Um we haven't contracted, but we we've reviewed. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, how many the frequency of applicants, the frequency that we get them done. I mean, everything that you know Gary's mentioning would all be like if you if the town has a contract. And you are essentially the the foreman of that contract. So you have to be on site and you have to supervise that that person is doing the job correctly. Like someone from the town basically needs to have responsibility that it's being done according to those bylaws, right? right. And that, yeah. that those would all have to be listed as part of the contract. To do it right is a significant amount of effort, I guess, is what I'm... And I, and I just wonder... Is that a realistic level of effort? I hear the value and the, I hear that loud and clear, and I agree with it. But does the town have the capacity to actually take that scope of work on? That's a good, that's a good question. In practice, we haven't had anyone out 
on site right when an HDA is being done. But the applicant would certainly be there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is, yeah, something to consider. Yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, for, for me, I don't, I don't uh, view having somebody on site as important as long as the they are reporting to the town on a, on a parcel, not reporting to uh, uh, an applicant on the parcel. Um, I I like the idea of t-shirt sizing, like small, medium, large projects. This is uh, rather than um, that might help us get better quotes uh, <laughs> and more confident quotes from the people on the list. And I like the idea of a list that the applicant gets to pick who we request a quote from, but they have to be like certified on our list. And these are the providers that we, that you can choose from. And as long as that's more than, let's say, at least five, then it, I think that helps alleviate a little bit of the um, concerns for an applicant of like, well, I have no control over this. Uh, I feel like a list of five or more uh, options that they can choose from to me gives them um, a certain level of influence and sense of control, even though, yeah. I mean, they probably don't know the difference between the different firms, but yeah. at least they get the feeling of like, okay, it's not just the town forcing on me saying you must use this contractor at this rate. <laughs> The problem is, is that that's not really a contract with the town. Like, you know, to get a, to get good bids, you kind of want to get, you want to make a promise that you're going to get half a dozen to a dozen projects per year, and then they'll put it in a competitive price. But if you say we're going to have an open contract that applicants can choose among the six of you, like people are going to give you crappy pricing because the value of actually the work is going to be seen as very low. Have we gotten that feedback from? <clears throat> no, I. No, I haven't gotten that feedback. Because I thought, I mean, other towns must also be requesting public data service assessments. Maybe not the same process we had, but something like that. But maybe some don't. Maybe, don't that's a, maybe that's a question we'll have. Yeah, we yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. but that's also very. Yeah, I don't know about Chittenden County, but again, outside of Chittenden County, that's very high possible, strong possibility. Um, and maybe that's another question we ask if and when we get other towns yeah. together with other towns about to talk about ERF stuff too. Um, so we should move on. We have um, our next guests are on screen now. Oh, okay. um, Andrew, just to wrap wrap that up. I, 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 so that's another one that seems like we need to have more conversation about. Um, I'm wondering if um, rather than over the next couple of meetings, we, we keep talking about both these things. Next meeting, we focus on one of them, and we can have a we can week meeting after that, we focus on the other one. Great. Uh, so we can dedicate another time and maybe knock one of them out. Mm -hmm. um, which would be more important to discuss first? The habitat service assessment or the ERF? I, I don't think there's a, a clear priority there. I would go up here. All right, then let's do the habitat disturbance assessment because I feel like that has a more immediate impact on the work that we in the town are doing. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can set aside a good chunk of time on the next agenda to cool. hopefully maybe get through all that. I don't know what else we An have. Hour? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the second meeting in June, maybe we can focus on the come back to the ERF stuff. Great. Awesome. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay, so our next agenda item, we have Eric Moody and Molly Costanza Robinson here from Millbury College to talk about water quality research in the Sucker Brook. Hi, Eric. Hi, Molly. I am Eric Howe. I'm the direct, um, wrong header. I am the chair of the Williston Conservation Commission, but I just, for your own uh, information, I also am the director of the Lake Champlain Basin Program, which is uh, supporting the project. Uh -huh. Today I'm wearing my conservation hat, <laughs> conservation commission hat, but uh, just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. <laughs> awesome. It's a small world. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> so um, I'll turn it over to, to both of you and 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 perhaps Andrew to, to share a little bit about your, your project with the with the group. I obviously am a bit familiar with it, but yeah, go ahead. Thanks for joining us. 
Did you have anything you want I, to share first? I would just like to thank both of them for, for being here. I received a message from Eric that um, to me and also to Lisa, who is our stormwater coordinator upstairs, um, that they were interested in uh, doing part of their study on town land in the Sucker Brook. Mm -hmm. And Eric had offered to meet with you all to discuss that project. And I, I were very supportive of it. Um, I had also said that I, I'd love to go out with them to just see where they're working. And, and if, I, if we get questions and I can answer them, hopefully, mm -hmm. or point them towards Eric if needed. Um, but yeah, appreciate you being here, Eric and Molly. Sounds good. Eric, Molly, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all right, great. Well, yeah, thanks all. Um, just a quick introduction. I'm Eric Moody. I'm a faculty member in the biology department at Middlebury College, and my research focus is on um, aquatic invertebrate ecology for the most part. Uh, and I'm also a member of the Middlebury Conservation Commission, newly appointed. So <laughs> I decided to yeah, talk about that as well at some point. Um, Molly, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, all. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm Molly Costanza Robinson. I'm an environmental chemist at Middlebury College. Um, my research is kind of varied, but basically contaminant fate and transport. So uh, on this project, I'm, I'm really looking at salt as that uh, contaminant and how does it transport? How does it get into our streams? And Eric and I have collaborated for a couple of years on various projects. And, and this is our latest, I think, really fun, hopefully impactful project. So thanks again. And we're happy to share it. Yeah, so um, I just have a few sort of introductory slides about the project uh, in sort of the scope of it, and um, then be happy to field any questions you have. We could talk about potential locations if uh, if that's of interest. Um, and yeah, I'll just go ahead and see if I can share my screen here. All right, so hopefully, can you all see? that yeah <clears throat> yeah right great. thank you great um yeah so as molly mentioned uh the focus of this project is on uh understanding the sources and consequences of stream salinization in headwater streams in the champlain basin and we chose to focus on headwater streams because these are often the ones that have the greatest direct impacts from salt, uh, you know, as opposed to something like the Winooski River, where it tends to get diluted uh, from all the different water sources. Um, some of these small streams, especially the ones that drain urban areas in Vermont, uh, tend to get quite salty to the uh, extent at which it might impact aquatic organisms, it might impact, um, you know, other uh, runoff of other pollutants, uh, et cetera. So there's a variety of potential sources of salinization, uh, and we've been interested in trying to understand, uh, you know, which of these sources might be contributing most to streams in the Burlington area, and uh, what impacts those might have. Um, so we've done a bunch of scouting of potential sites, and um, the sites that we've proposed for this project that the Lake Champlain Basin Program has funded uh, are these eight uh, watersheds here, ranging from uh, Burlington and South Burlington and the more urban end of the spectrum out to some sites in Richmond, uh, which are more on the forested end of that spectrum. And so they're color coded from you know, yellow being uh, almost entirely forested to dark blue being um, you know, very heavily urbanized, at least, you know, in the, the Vermont sense of heavily urbanized. Um, so we've got, uh, you know, Snipe Island Brook, if you're familiar with that site in Richmond, on the uh, Prelco uh, property is a, a well-protected forested watershed. And then we have streams like Centennial Brook and Potash Brook in Burlington and South Burlington that are much more impacted by urban land use and impervious surfaces. Uh, we've done some preliminary monitoring at, at these sites to uh, inform this proposal. And so just uh, a few preliminary slides of data that we've collected so far. Um, we've 
looked at chloride concentrations, and these are uh, estimated chloride concentrations based on the specific conductivity, and I'd be happy to talk about that. We're going to start measuring chloride specifically with a new instrument that we just got uh, here as part of this project. Um, but the, the bottom line is that chloride concentrations in some of these really urban streams uh, almost always exceed the EPA's chronic criterion uh, for chloride for aquatic life and often even exceed the acute criterion, which is certainly not good. Um, Sucker Brook, in, you know, the one site that we have in Williston is this sort of greenish colored site here. Uh, the good news is that it does not exceed, it has never exceeded in our, our preliminary sampling, that chronic uh, criterion standard. Uh, and we chose that as it, you know, it is a little bit more developed than some of our more reference kinds of sites, but it's, uh, you know, still relatively not urbanized. And so that's good news. Um, we've, uh, this, this figure actually came from a thesis student, uh, Baker Engstman, who's actually from Williston, uh, and he just defended his thesis yesterday. So <laughs> it's exciting to have him uh, do this work. Uh, he's been working on this approach to try to determine what the sources of salt are across these streams. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is based on, on uh, various, it's called a chemical fingerprinting approach, and it's based on sort of various ratios of different uh, chemicals in water samples that we've collected from these sites. And so the the yellow colors so represents natural ions in groundwater that we would expect to find in Vermont, uh, based on the geology here. And then um, green would be agricultural sources like fertilizers and things of that sort. Uh, yellow, or sorry, uh, purple is uh, de-icing salt, which is, uh, he represented as just sodium chloride as the most common salt that uh, V-trans and tans use in Vermont. And then uh, the red and blue are septic and wastewater treatment plants. And we know there's not actually wastewater treatment plants in a lot of these watersheds, like there's no wastewater treatment plant in Sucker Brook. Um, so there's some other source that we're still kind of working on figuring out what exactly that might be. Would that sort of more yeah. general sources would be failing septic systems and leach fields? Yeah, exactly. That's what we're thinking is that uh, leaking septic systems or yeah, leach fields might be contributing uh, potentially. And uh, it seems like there's more that we could do to separate out what might be septic versus wastewater treatment would, or you know, potentially some other sources of salt that we didn't account for, like um, you know, magnesium chloride that might be used uh, or calcium chloride, um, some of these things that are used on like dirt roads for dust control, um, et cetera. But yeah, the good news and you know, for you all in Sucker Brook is that um, you know, most of the, the salt it comes from natural sources in the groundwater, at least, you know, according to this preliminary analysis, and we'll be diving in to look at that more closely. Uh, when you get to streams like Centennial, and then this uh, this one called Cata is a tributary of Potash Brook that drains like the University Mall area mm -hmm. in South sure. Burlington. Uh, it's like almost 50% of the watershed is impervious surface in that stream. Uh, those are, are pretty heavily dominated by red salts, according to this analysis. Um, when we start to look at the benthic invertebrates, uh, we have a little bit less good news in that, you know, not surprisingly, uh, the diversity of invertebrates declines as chloride concentrations increase across these streams, uh, but it's actually declining far below that EPA chronic criterion. And part of this might be you know, because some of these urban streams have other stressors associated with them. So it's not just a chloride concentration gradient. There's certainly other things about a stream like Centennial Brook that are stressful to invertebrates. Uh, but it is a little bit alarming and we're not the first folks to point out that this criteria might be actually a little bit too high. Um, so you know, here at Sucker Brook, uh, we do see you know, from our preliminary data, uh, certainly less taxa uh, than we find at some of the, the more forested sites, which is a little bit 
uh, alarming, and we'll be uh, ramping up and expanding this monitoring. So you know, these are fairly preliminary data, uh, and we'll be interested to see how that trend plays out over the next few years. Um, so with the funding from the Basin Program, uh, we are proposing to install high-frequency sensors. These will have chloride, um, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and water level sensors that they'll be logging at 10-minute uh, intervals in these eight streams. And this will allow us to understand sort of how high chloride concentrations get during you know, peak runoff events, uh, what specifically causes th those high concentrations and, and when in the year are chloride concentrations highest and lowest, uh, as well as calculate fluxes of chloride into like Champlain and the Winooski River ultimately. Um, we'll be using an experimental setup in our lab here at the college to test how salinization and some of these other urban stressors like increased temperatures or other pollutants might uh, cause changes in the benthic invertebrate communities. And we're certainly interested in this as this can help us understand uh, you know, what species might be the best indicators of salt pollution and how salt pollution specifically might be affecting these systems. Uh, we are also proposing to use that same system in the lab to investigate the toxicity of other gasing compounds. And, you know, some of these are things like these uh, pet safe formulas that, you know, towns are not likely using, but individual property owners and contractors who do de-icing for private property uh, might be using more of these kinds of things. Uh, not, not much is actually known about their toxicity to freshwater organisms, though. So we'll be doing that with some of these benthic invertebrate species that we find in streams in this region. Uh, and then, yeah, what we're doing you know, today, uh, and what we'll be hoping to do a lot more of, I'm certainly excited about doing more of this in my role with the Middlebury Conservation Commission also, is just engaging with uh, public and other uh, stakeholders to consider ways to safely reduce de-icing salt usage. Um, and, you know, obviously that's a, a, the safe part is an important part of that, uh, but we're excited about that as well. Uh, so I could continue, but I think I'll stop there. Uh, I'll just say that in Sucker Brook, the site that we've identified for uh, installing sensors and, and doing this monitoring work is at the, the Sucker Brook Hollow Trail Park, uh, sort of at that lower, that first bridge crossing that you get to on that trail. Um, <clears throat> I know, you know, from having gone out there, there's there's a whole bunch of signs everywhere that say private property, like, please do not trespass. And so I did want to check in with you about, like, and maybe this could, could also be going out with Andrew as to, like, where the best place might be to install that to make sure that we are on the town's property uh, and not potentially uh, upsetting anybody, but uh, happy to answer any questions or talk about anything that you're interested in. Great. Thanks, Eric. So it's just the one monitor? Uh, for Williston, yeah, it will just be that one site. Uh, we have other, you know, those eight sites. Um, more of them are in South Burlington and Richmond. It just sort of worked out that way with, based on the streams that we were able to identify as being uh, kind of ideal candidates for the study. Um, but we're certainly you know, always interested in finding other sites that might be worth monitoring. And if there's places that the town's interested in, um, or, you know, Ooh, we, we don't have- Oh, how do you get? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's that? Thank you. We're very interested, thank you. Um, okay, Reed. Um, uh, two, two comments. Um, one is that uh, the Allen Brook, which is an impaired waterway, is one that we've struggled to find a sustainable uh, monitoring program for. We've had all sorts of iterations of it, and currently it is not being uh, monitored, I think, except for one site that's monitored by some other organization um, at the 2A crossing. Um, anyway. Uh, we we're it's under monitor and it 
where we would we wish we could do more. So maybe we could have a conversation about that. Uh -huh. um, um, and uh, the the other comment is just to ask is actually a question. What what types of things uh, would cause problems for your monitoring? Like I assume tampering, of course, if somebody touched it or dislodged it from its location. Uh, or I also imagine if people are like duck pets or people are walking in the stream just upstream from it, I imagine that would also be a problem. So what types of, are there other issues that we should be aware of in helping you pick a good site? Yeah, uh, certainly, you know, the worst thing that could happen would be if someone like ripped it out of the stream <laughs> and ran <laughs> off with it. Uh, that's happened to me a couple of times in my career, but it's not that common. Uh, it seems like it's more common that someone might just like think it's trash or like the other dog knocks it over or something like that. So we'd, we would like to place it somewhere that's kind of not obviously visible from the trail for that reason. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, I know people do like to walk their dogs over there. So if, uh, you know, you'd know this site better than I do. So if there's places that you think, well, yeah, nobody's likely to have their dog running around in that spot, that would certainly be useful. Um, yeah, those are the things that like are on the human side. Obviously there's, you know, floods. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're all familiar with that now. Uh, those are certainly gonna be issues too. And so uh, I've had bigger issues with like things of that sort than, than people, honestly. Um, so, you know, that'll just come from us really working and we've learned a lot as to how to anchor these things to keep them in place. Uh, but we can never be a hundred percent sure. I just had a similar question. I mean, it seems like there's almost like two ways to go at it. Like hide the thing and don't tell anybody. Yeah. Or, right. or hide. I, I would suggest at least like hide it, but let's have some signs describing mm -hmm. the project briefly so that people are aware that we're concerned about it and that we're trying to monitor it, I think would be would be valuable. Yeah. It's a very high visitation site. Yes. There's a mm -hmm. lot of hikers. It is. That's probably uh our our busiest, if if not the busiest, and probably the second busiest trail that we have in town. Um that gets used by a lot of people, not just from Williston, but commuters going home to Heinsberg on the way from work and, and all that. Um, mm -hmm. the, that location that you're looking at with that first, that first crossing that bridge. Um, yeah, I would, there's, yeah, I mean, you get kids that play in the brook down there. There's dogs that are running around in the, in the brook down there. Um, so maybe not necessarily a vandalism point, but, uh, or concern, I mean, there certainly could be a vandalism concern, but aside from that, um, accidental. Yeah. 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 Uh, mm -hmm. And you could just get people well, stirring up the brook. Yeah. Or unrepresentative of the brook, too. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was going to suggest upstream a yeah. bit from there, you know, even just 20 yards upstream mm -hmm. from that initial bridge. So it's still easy to access. Would protect you from a lot of the activity. I mean, you can see the footprints where people go down around the bridge to the brook. So even just a, you know, a, a number of yards upstream from there would protect you a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would most likely require you to get permission from the private landowner because there isn't a lot of town owned land left upstream of that bridge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the, the sentiments of the landowners are other than that I know that they have a lot of signage up there Posting on the property. So Eric, you're talking even <clears throat> north of here? Oops. No, the other direction. Oh, oh upstream. So oh, it's okay. south. So it's south. Okay. <clears throat> so it'd be down. Does yeah. town own all this? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Upstream. And that's the bridge right there. Yeah. Right? Okay. So it would be down. Yeah, it flows. Yeah. It flows from the bottom to the top of yeah. the map here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for some reason I forgot that. I mean, alternatively, oh. you could go way yeah. downstream, but um, yeah. I'm not sure what is it is that right? Is. It flows. No, that's no, not right. It flows right. from the north to it the south. To the north. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. so it is. All right. So upstream. There it is right. It's closer to the parking. <laughs> but it's in the parking mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. 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 This is a bridge. So we own yeah. all that. So there should be an opportunity. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. In order oh, why it. does I think it flows the other direction? I guess that's because yeah. that's headed toward the Winooski right there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
Uh, yeah, so, all right, never mind. I retract all of that. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is, so upstream in that area, now that I know which way is upstream, um, there is a uh, a former, not former, but a, a restoration planting area because there was some pretty significant erosion events that happened mm -hmm. 15 years ago or so upstream of that area. Um, and so there's that to consider, but also I think there may still be like some access trails off the north end of that parking lot. Uh, okay. Yeah, that'd be People good. People are pretty good about only going down the trail from the parking lot. It's like yeah. a very well <clears throat> shaped and labeled entrance. I have not seen people just like wandering off other directions. Yeah, so that would be um, maybe if, if, uh, I can connect with Andrew if you know, you know where these trails would be. Like maybe that might be the best spot to to aim for. Yeah. I think we had talked about going out. Um, I didn't know if you would, would go out for a preliminary visit, but um, I'd be happy to meet you out there and and we could walk yeah. it. Um, and you, I, 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 have you been out there? I assume you have. Yeah, yeah, we've been out there, um, but I haven't really gone like super far upstream from the bridge. We just kind of go collect water samples right at that spot when we do. I'll just uh, jump in that we've been out there just about every other week for the last 18 months or so, um, and our next normal sampling would be happening on Friday the 24th. If that were a time, we, we'll be out there doing our grab sampling anyway. Um, I don't know if anyone would be able to join us then or we could we could plan a, a separate time. What time of day are you usually there? Um, that's our first, uh, I think we're actually planning on leaving a little bit earlier than normal. It's, it's big graduation reception day here, so the students have to get back. Um, so I think we'd probably be there between say eight and nine a.m. Okay. okay. But I, again, we can plan a separate time that works works for you. I could be up there as well. Um, yeah, I could probably meet you there. I thought that time would work for me. Awesome. Yeah, that would be Thanks. great. That sounds good. Eric, are you able to make that f the the Friday? Uh, I will try. I can't confirm that right now. Okay. It's also my mom's birthday on top of all that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she wants to go for a hike. Sure. All right. Awesome. Uh, other questions for Eric or Molly? Thank you for considering yeah. Wilson. Yeah. Sounds like a great project. I will add, add you know, more sites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To your earlier comment, we did look at Allenbrook and we just didn't find a good access point that we thought would work for our study for that stream. Um, if you have like a monitoring location that you use, maybe yeah. you could send us that. Um, because we may just have overlooked something or maybe it's not on a public, you know, we were trying to find places that look like they have public access points. So uh, well to name at least one, um there is a bridge um directly over the Allenbrook um off of Talcott, but I'd probably recommend um there's an access road that the Williston um that the actual the Champlain Water District and uses for monitoring. There's a it's it's a pump station. And it's right on the it's right on the Allenbrook, and mm. it's actually I'm actually not thinking of the two way pump station. Okay. I'm thinking of the um, Brennan Woods. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's got a easy to access dirt road, and it brings you right down to the water's okay. edge. Is that locked off? Is it chained off that road? Um, you, you just walk it. Yeah, it, it's yeah. like it's like a thirty. Um, it's not very far. There's that road there you are talking about. Yeah. yeah, it's just a dirt path that um, leads down to that um, pump station, and then there's the there's the brook right there. That actually is mm -hmm. on town land too, on the, the actual access. Mm -hmm. 
This um, parcel is owned by the town. What road is that that is come and <clears throat> Barrett 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 Lane. On the um, did you already mention the um pump station access off of Old Stage Road? Barrett Lane is another one. Yeah. I don't know. How, I mean, the, there's a there's a town owned pump station off of Old Stage Road in Williston. Um, I'm trying to picture how easy it would be to get down into the brook, but it's right on the brook. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> These yeah, things yeah. tend to be uh -huh. <laughs> right adjacent to the brook. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, uh we found a few of our other sites by looking for pump stations. <laughs> yeah. There is another one farther downstream off of um well, I mean you can just get drive. If, but... if you're there, you might as well you might as well just use the uh pathway over uh, on um right there, the the, the rec pad. Uh, yeah, the rec pad It's part of the school you've been calling it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either way. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, if you <laughs> wanted to look at Allenbrook, there's we could certainly chat with you more about the opportunities to access it. The Brennan Woods uh dirt road idea is a great one because there's just a lot less human activity in the oh, yeah. vicinity. Whereas if you do anything near the school, yeah. it's just it's great because the access is good. Um, and there's a lot of like nice you can just walk down to the water's edge near the bridges, but mm. there's people constantly and pets and yeah. there's even been people trapping. <laughs> it's kids minnow, you know, uh, like minnows. Yeah, sure, so sure. So it's just like, it's dynamic, but uh, I like David's suggestion. That one is easy to get to and it would be a nice, like, controlled setting for you to have a test site. In. Yeah, and there's a, even right. a great, there's great trail running all along that. <laughs> if you want it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> After a long car ride up from, from Middlebury. Yeah. Um, um, move the legs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe we'll, uh, we're going to have our summer research students starting in early June. Um, so, you know, we've got this, you know, this, the core site for this project is one of our priorities, but we might go poke around with them at, at Allen Brook and see if it's worth at least doing a little bit of. I can show you that site in a heartbeat. I'll bring my dog. There is um, <laughs> another advantage to that one is the. Uh, this is years ago now, but um, Laura Medley at the U.S. Geological Survey did some chloride sampling work and produced a report on chloride concentrations in Allenbrook. Um, there's two other Chittenden County streams as part of that study that she published. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll give you some history background information to you to work with and and the usgs has maintained a gauge on allen brook for or had maintained a gauge rather for quite a while right. yeah at the 2a crossing yeah the lack of gauges in vermont has been a, yeah. a <laughs> challenge for us yep <laughs> i'll actually be writing a letter to the usgs about that when i start my day job Good. if you uh yeah. if you want any other Signatories, I'd be happy to <laughs> <laughs> uh, Awesome. Uh, we're just about out of time. Anything else from the, the group here for Eric and Molly, or anything, Molly or Eric, you want to share with us? No, I uh, um, okay. Yeah, maybe Andrew will crack of some of these <clears> places <throat> we just talked about. I know we, we went through some things on a map. Yeah. yeah, just say here's three, four possibilities. Yeah. And if mm -hmm. they, if they do want to spot that um that area off of Barrett Lane, I can I can meet you there. Great. All right, great. And I, so I've got um the eight o'clock and the twenty fourth penciled in. We can con confirm that later too. But yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I'll sh I'll shoot an email, check with my students, just graduation receptions and all that. See how early we're going to have to leave. But Sucker Brook is usually our first stop, so it's a once we we know what time we're leaving, we'll have a predictable time to meet you, and that would be awesome to to meet you there and explore yeah. upstream. Yeah, sounds good. Maybe I'll drag Matt along with me too. Oh, great! <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. They're grading the path connector between Dunmore and Beaudry.
I noticed on, on oh, yeah. a run last week. So we're going to finally have trail connectivity from 2A into um, task corners in crossing. So they're grading the path? Well, they're they're doing all of that landscaping. Yeah, they're they're basically oh. they're like they're they're plowing the space for the roads and they're building up and they're berming, um, you know, like where the sidewalks and the pathway is going to be. So I, it's interesting. It's very exciting to finally yeah. know that I'm not going to have to run on two way anymore. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah, we've gotten lots of actually comments about that about how excited people are. So that's great. Yeah, I um, I've even got friends who are abroad right now and have been for many years, and I'm looking forward to the day when I can snap that picture and send it to them and say, "It happened. It happened." <laughs> yeah, I've gotten a a note about a bootleg bridge over near the water the pumping station we're talking about. Someone, I, I don't know what, how big it is, but yeah, I, I, I still think how do you get across the river? Yeah. Check that out. Um, so you actually, you actually go through the fire road and the Brennan Woods. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it, there's basically a path along Allenbrook in those woods. Yeah. And then, it, and then, it, and then it, once you hit the fire road, then you jog quick left back into the into the trail yeah and then it follows it all the way up to the pathway and it's actually a really nice run mm -hmm. and it's going to be nice when that pathway is complete back to the agenda though yes um all right so uh, other business first up is nominations for chair and vice chair this is for a vote in june is that correct? Correct. And treasurer and treasurer. And treasurer. Yes. Um, we had talked about that. So um, we'd like to have that vote done before the start of July. The DRB did theirs last night. We can maybe do it when we have hopefully everybody here. Um, but I don't know if, if anyone needs a reminder on Robert's rules. We can nominate. Basically, we'll, we'll have a time for people, someone to nominate or anyone to nominate. Um, for all of these positions, we'll hear those nominations and then you can vote on them from there. Um, all right. So, so we have chair, vice chair, and treasurer. Mm -hmm. And so we um, can have an informal discussion today and um, make nominations sure. today. Let's, you take. Let's, let's do that. Um, so these are all, we do this as one year terms, positions, whatever, for each of them, right? Um, I so I've served as chair for two years now. I feel like that's good for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for um, your service. Yeah. Thank, Thank yep. you. And happy to step down and, and turn it over to to something to somebody else. Um and uh so I guess I, I'll just put it out there, you know, recognizing that Terry's Terry's our treasurer and is, is not here. Um, but are there other folks on the commission who are interested in serving as chair or vice chair? Or or treasurer. I have no idea if Terry's interested in staying on as treasurer, and um, I would also I think you know she's always great to me. But anyway, um, is anyone else interested in serving in, in the role of chair or and or or not in but or vice chair? <laughs> <laughs> so I was gonna say I'd do the treasury if Terry's not okay. if, if she's up for taking a break. Right. I, I indicated that if um, if, if you want, are stepping down, that I'll take the role of chair. For a period of time, um, as long as it's not more, not more than ten years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for sure. yeah. But I, when I'm, I'm happy to get ahead of it. Share the share the load. Awesome. Thank Eric you. Eric and I talked ahead of this, and I'm um, happy to be considered for vice chair, with the understanding that that usually means being chair in the future at some point. <laughs> Ah, and then I'll also so just say, not years. that like I don't want you to be treasurer, Gary. I think that would be awesome. But if I do think it was nice when Carl was treasurer for a long time that there was like continuity. And I I don't like has that has that historically been? I guess he was treasurer for so long that historically yeah, yeah. Was his entire well, term, yeah. right? <laughs> like twenty years. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Carl's the only other treasurer I've known yeah. in my time of the Conservation Commission. <laughs> We should uh, nominate people to be appointed as Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be the Carl for the next year, Carl. Yeah.
Probably you can get Kyle back. Chair, <laughs> seat. I, I do agree, actually. That I mean, there's there's value in having consistency um, in that in that position yeah. for sure. There is. Yeah, like I said, if Terry is up for staying, I'm happy to. Okay. Not make like a. Or if she's not, it means that you have to like serve for a 30 year term. <laughs> she's a no comment. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so we can let me just make sure I'm gonna be here next month, June 1st. <clears throat> I think I am. June 1st. Oh god. <laughs> Did anyone reach out to Terry? No, I, I did not reach out to Terry. Oh boy, that's a very busy day for me. Um, oh, we have two. We have two options to consider for nominations for treasurer. So that's yeah, we're in good shape. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess I don't see a problem. Yeah. What was that, Kim? Well, I was just gonna say, like the other, the other option would be like to have some type of like overlapping system so that there's. I don't know. I'm just thinking about like how many times we were like, what did we do five years ago? Right. And like, if, if like the treasurer stuff doesn't happen in our meetings, like I think Carl and I'm imagining Terry did like a lot of stuff at home and prep, not that the chair and vice chair don't, they do, but could there be some like overlap? I'm, like I'm glad you think so. What? I'm glad that you think so. <laughs> um, Maybe so it's just I'm, because I'm, when I was chair last, we were also doing catamount, and I feel like I put in like a lot. Oh, of, yeah. There was like a lot of like at home stuff. Anyway, could there be like some like period of overlap if we when we're switching treasurers? Oh yeah. Yeah, maybe if Terry's up for doing it one more year, I could work with her. Oh, I see. that year. Yeah. Is that what you mean, Tim? Because they're all one year positions. Yeah, I wasn't thinking like a whole, I mean, I wasn't thinking a specific amount of time, but just like, uh, yeah, like rather than like, I'm just, I, I would do so poorly if someone just like handed me a budget and was like, okay, you're up, bye. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, all right, well, let's, um, I'll, I'll connect with Terry in the intervening week or so. I'm. I'm. Gonna, we have two weeks off. We this is one of those well, nice right. two week periods. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna actually have to think about whether or not I can make it on June 5th because we have a very large event that day for work. Um, and then the following. Well, I don't. So you know, no big deal. All right. I mean, I could definitely make it on the 19th. So you sort of have to just have to get all squared away by the ninth, end of the night, Monday. All right. If, um, we're, if we're done voting by the nineteenth, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It seems like it's at least it's not a you know a problem. Anything it sounds like we have it figured out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't be hard to do to make a final vote on the nineteenth. And we've already established that we're not as important as the DRB. Yes. The DRB is just very uh, <laughs> well, they're overachievers, I guess. Yeah. At this point. <laughs> They were. They probably proclaimed that last night. I know. So they pulled them out. Well, they have. Well, sometimes it's hard to find people that have the time to yeah, do these yeah. things, and it can get to be a pain. No joke. Have you seen the packet of materials they have to review before oh, every yeah. meeting? Yeah. yeah. Just... Well, um, so I mean, as Andrew pointed out, we can do this piecemeal. So if I mean, if someone wanted to um, advance the the chair and vice chair today, we could talk about treasurer. Another time when we uh, do we want to vote uh, on that today is what we're suggesting. Yeah, yeah. If we could take a motion, yeah. yeah, I make a motion that David become chair and Kim become vice chair as of what July one is that when it would take effect? June thirtieth. Yeah, then, um, yeah, they should be separate, but for a one year term separate motions, but all well, separate motions. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we need to one, one, one motion per. Seat. Oh, okay. Robert's okay. rules. So I make a motion that David David become chair for one year starting the end of June. Okay, thank you, Gary. Oh, sorry, sorry, Kim. Kim. Can we just beat you out there, Kim? Yeah, by a tenth of a second. Any discussion on the motion? Only because there's a delay on the line. <laughs> <laughs> you do account for that. Uh, any discussion on the motion? 
happy to serve. Thank you for the nomination. Thank you, David. Um, all right, all in yeah, favor? Promises, like, food <laughs> nope, and nope, nope, not making any of those promises. <laughs> that's that's the heresy rule. Yeah. <laughs> in in <laughs> person <laughs> attendance is only possible during sunlight hours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. And I'll make now make a motion that Kim become vice chair starting July 1 for a term of one year. Second. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, discussion on that motion. All right. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Tim, are you abstaining? I feel like I have to, right? <laughs> I think that's fair. You can abstain if you'd like. You can abstain if you'd like. Or you can You're in either way, way, so yeah. All right. <laughs> um, motion carries. Thank you, Kim. And uh, that's great. Thank you to both of you for uh, agreeing to do that. Thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will reach out to Terry uh, soon and just ask her if she's interested in staying on as treasurer for another year. Yeah. Um, thank you. And let her know that. Is she also home. currently chairing the Catamount Forest Committee? Yeah. Yes. I did. I didn't so think she was. I thought vice chair. Vice chair. Oh, okay. Yeah. Vice chair. Yeah. Okay. Just thinking it's like a lot of, like, I don't know. Maybe she likes having that much stuff on her plate, but it seems like I saw her out there leading a birding expedition. She looked like uh, she was in her element. <laughs> so Eric, you might want to mention to her that if 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 she wants to stay on but wants to support some overlap, I could work with her during that year so that it's, things go more smoothly beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, excellent. Any other other business? Just upcoming meetings, which we sort of discussed. Um, I'd mentioned that I have not reached out to our uh, contact at CDU Stan about that discussion. Hope to do that prior to that next meeting. Um, I think with the HDA discussion and that, I have a pretty full agenda. And I also just say recognize that we've, we've sort of been punting the Winooski Valley Park District and town plan. <clears throat> town plan drafts are in the works. Okay. Um, make sure they have the first chapter due tomorrow at noon. Um, at noon. All right. right. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> you need, to, you need like... to tell Eric, the manager, that writing is always due on Friday. Yes, that's Matt. <laughs> oh, that's Matt. Yeah, and that like noon is a weird like Friday sure. at four yeah. p.m. or five p. four p.m. Absolutely, thank you for standing behind me here. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't looking for that, but thank you. Be <laughs> yeah. um, for example, every NSF grant deadline. <laughs> yeah. So you say the first chapter, does that mean chapter one or your first chapter that you're responsible for? So even saying chapters is, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, yeah. So we're working in different topic areas. And so the one I'm working on right now is specific to rural land use and subdivision design. Okay. Um, it's unclear at this point, but that may. We're also working on conservation as a topic or working on working landscapes as a topic and my opinion is that those sort of all are one thing and yeah, we'll, we'll find a good way to separate those out but uh, that makes sense but uh, that is the format right now um, and there's a, a sort of a two-week rolling process with the planning commission meetings on, on working through those so the goal is to have a, a draft by the end of the summer and you all will be involved on that. Um, very much welcome your your feedback. And I've been I've been looking at the interview you did at the last time plan. Um, and that's right. That was a side helpful. Yes. Um, I know Simon took really good notes. So yes, yeah, I, I'd be interested too, and in, um, your interest to revisit that. I think it was a little unclear to me how 
complete that was uh, if you finished that. So I again we've established how reliable my memory is here today, <laughs> but um I I guess I felt that we had our, our role and was in that was just looking at uh the, the elements of the last town plan and just providing feedback on how we might how whether or not we felt the the, the town plan captured the right right pieces and what else might be considered for the new it was a, for the it was, chapters. It was a curated experience. Simon was going through the town plan and pulling out <laughs> parts and sections that were relevant to our discussions, whether that be like in the sort of informal discussions, like you know, what a lot of this meeting was, or a more formal like review of an application process. Mm -hmm. And that was really the elements of the plan that he was plucking out and having us talk about very specifically. It was you know, it was not the full town plan, but it was a curated right. experience. Yeah, that makes sense. Good description. Yep. Um, so I guess when the uh relevant chapters are ready for us to look at would be i think i'd say we yeah it'd be great for us to have an opportunity yeah. to look at them that's yeah. The hope. yeah that's yeah fully my goal and um having someone else at the front desk will be helpful to um, they have been doing that too oh, ouch oh Oof. Yeah. And you have to write by thursday at noon <laughs> that's wrong so hey, we're we're uh, trying to make it work here, and yeah, cool. um, yeah, we've got some time, but it's it's certainly that deadline is is looming. So okay, um, are we busy? Thank you. Well, uh, yeah. great. we can uh, adjourn and let you get to yeah. Yeah. meeting your deadline. Then. Thank you. We didn't yeah. even talk about the polydor garden, but it went really well. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, here, let me add. I did want to hear about the polydor garden. Oh, you got some pictures. <laughs> I have a picture, and it's it's. I I, I jogged by there yesterday for for uh, for that purpose to check it out, and it looked great from the bike path. And it just rained, so I didn't wander over there. So there were plantings there, were, there. Yeah, there were uh, oh. eleven students, including oh. two photographers. So that they will have lots of photographs too. Nice. So that's uh, Marcy Cass standing up, mm -hmm. and uh, Brian Forrest on his knees working on the fencing. Yeah, um, that's the portion that is uh, for more formal garden. So it's got um, perennials in the first two thirds, and then in the back where Marcy is is an area that was. We took more of the grass clods out mm -hmm. and spread wildflower seeds. So it's more of like just a wildflower seed. And area then do you back. put anything over them or you just literally spread the seed? Uh, rake it in a rake little it bit. in and water. And then it rained yesterday and it's yeah. supposed to rain the next couple of days, maybe. Yeah. So that's pretty ideal for the germination period. And then you maybe can see behind her, behind the fencing. Uh, and thanks to Andrew, who uh, coordinated the fencing, the posts, and, and we were able to get. We we did that as adults, and the students helped with everything inside. Um, and behind Marcy, you may be able to kind of see there's a, actually a tilled row running left to right that extended down further. And um, out of the picture to the left is about 40, 45 raspberry plants that have been added in. Um, thank but you. Can I give you that many? Well, we also took some from the oh, Williston, okay. uh, the raised beds at the Williston student garden area uh because it needed to be trimmed back i got that many more again than i need to thin out no, so. i mean we could <laughs> we could take we could take more for sure um but we there's def, it definitely looks intentional so one of the things that i know deb was trying to make sure from sustainable was trying to make sure we didn't do was do something that was like oh we put it in and people are like what is that uh you know just doesn't so it looks like a fairy patch has been planted um and this looks like an intentional garden has been planted and uh sure does some of the ongoing work that'll happen is um the the uh mulching to make sure that it can stay looking good over time so we're going to try to add uh, i know deb's family plans to do some this weekend and Jason and i will probably make one more trip with whatever we can manage to bring uh to mulch not just around each perennial but also the pathways in between so that it stays looking nice and it's easy to weed for uh, students or volunteers <clears throat> to do that okay so go check it out it it's right right by the disc golf uh, practice yeah set up and 
I've also noticed that the town or someone has been scraping away at that ground. Yeah. It's no longer bikeable. It's like a cliff now. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's so that is topsoil. It's the town's yeah. topsoil yeah, uh, right. deposit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they just come in yeah, and they, they came in at a very wet period and yeah, they wrecked oh, the soil that. ground all the way in. Bruce wasn't happy about that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he wasn't. Yeah, because that looks it looked bad. It's going to take a lot of work to fix. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what I mean? That's not, that can't be all that the, the rolls of sod are that were delivered the other day that are over no. by the wreck storage part. It's not and, sod, it's just you know, dirt. Yeah. yeah. Because we there were some big rolls that were over really? by tractor trailer on um, oh. Thursday last week. Must right. have plans for something. Oh yes, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. So there I Andrew and my things. kids did recently like send it on that. So <laughs> I don't know. If I think like if you're willing to crash on your face, it's still bikeable. Yeah. <laughs> if you're looking for a six foot drop, then it's your place. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get going. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.